Today's talk is Bringing Fluid Dynamics to Life in the Ocean. It's going to be given by Marina Levy. It's a great honour to have her here. Uh, Marina got her PhD in oceanography in 1996 from the Université Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris, which is now part of the Sorbonne University. She then did a postdoc at the Le Mans Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University before moving back to Paris and joining the Institut Pierre Simon Laplace in the Sorbonne University in 1998, where she is now a director de recherche. Amongst her many distinctions, she was awarded a bronze medal from the CNRS in 2005. Marina studies the interactions between ocean physics, biogeochemistry, and marine ecosystems. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about this work. So Marina, please. Thank you. Do you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for this introduction. I'm very honored to be here today uh, in this, uh, among, among you, you're you are very um, numerous and I cannot see you, unfortunately, but I will imagine uh, all of you. Uh, it's an honor for me because I don't uh, really work on fluid dynamics, but my, my research interest has been on ocean biogeochemical cycles. And I will try to show you today how fluid dynamics is, is crucial to understanding ocean biogeochemical cycles. So I will be talking about life in the ocean. Uh, I, I will not uh, explain you why there is life in the ocean, but I will try to convince you that without uh, a fluid dynamics, there would barely be any life in the ocean. My uh, particular interest over, over most of my career has been devoted to uh, a specific uh, class of fluid dynamics in the ocean over a specific range of scales, uh, which is illustrated by this image here, and which ranges between uh, one and 100 kilometer, which is, corresponds to the scales of instabilities at the surface of the ocean uh, due to the instabilities of the currents, these eddies and filaments that arise from, from these eddies. And, and uh, I've tried to uh, link uh, this, uh, this, this specific dynamics to the growth of uh, phytoplankton. This is one illustration of, of a phytoplankton cell. It's a very, very tiny microbe. Uh, it's the size of this one is two micrometer. And I will come back on this. I wanted to start by something which is completely uh, sort of unrelated to what I'm going to talk about today which is this image I'm sure you've all seen uh, over the last week, which is uh, Mars, a scene from Perseverance. And the reason I wanted to show this, uh, this wonderful and amazing uh, image from, from the NASA is that the, 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 really the goal of this mission was to search uh, life on Mars. And, and it has received a lot of coverage on, on the press. And one of the reasons uh, uh, scientists exploring Mars, Mars think that there has been a life on Mars is because they think there has been water on Mars. But for, for us uh, oceanographers, there, there has been another NASA mission which has been as important as this one, and that occurred 30 years back. 30 years back, there was the launch of this uh, um, satellite which was observing for the first time the color of the ocean from space and you see here an image which was published in National Geographic in the December 1981 issue and that, that was really as, as, as impressive as seeing Mars because we had never seen um, the, 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 the variation of the colors of the sea with, with such details. And what the color of the sea reflects is really the optical properties which are due to the, the pigments of the phytoplankton at the surface of the ocean, the chlorophyll, and, and, and the way they reflect life, uh, light, sorry, uh, gives an idea of their distribution. And you can see, the, and for the first time, we could really witness the, the, the interplay between the presence of, of this tiny plankton and the fluid dynamics, because you, you can re clearly recognize some features here we, which remind you of, of the, the dynamics of, of the fluid. Um, so let me just tell you a bit more about phytoplankton for, for those of you who are not familiar with this. 
So most of life, actually 90% of the, of the living biomass in the ocean is in the form of these microbes, microorganisms, which are um, photosynthetic organisms. So they create organic material uh, using uh, light and uh, they're called phytoplankton from phytoplant and plankton wanderer. And that's, that's, that's the first link towards uh, um, ocean uh, dynamics and, and fluid dynamics is that they are transported by ocean currents. They don't have their own motility. And um, what's important is that, and the reason why we, we, we study uh, plankton is that they provide multiple uh, services. They're important for climate, they take up CO2, they provide oxygen, and they also sustain the, the entire marine food web. They're eaten by, by, um, by zooplankton, which themselves are eaten by fish, and so they sustain the food web. So really, all life in the ocean, most life in the ocean, starts with this phytoplankton, which, which is like the most enormous uh, quantity of organic material in the ocean. Um, what's also important about plankton is really beautiful organisms. They are microscopic and there's a huge diversity of plankton. And this diversity is important because the different species will have different biogeochemical functions. They will play different roles. They, they come in, uh, in um, different sizes, morphology, they like different environments. And it's very important for us to understand why and where and they grow and which kind of, of species grows. And to understand this, we have to really relate this with, with the fluid dynamics in the ocean. And I'm going to try to explain you um, why this is the case. So as I said, they are invisible to the eye, uh, they are microscopic, but they are visible from satellites. And it's very beautiful to look at these satellite images. Uh, and I'm going to show a few examples. Uh, this is one, this is the, the, the north of Spain. Uh, this is another one in the Gulf of Finland. This is really widespread. We see this in all kinds of images. Another very beautiful eight feature. Uh, this is with uh, one of the latest uh, satellites. This is a, a, a mission by the European Space Agency, ESA, with the Sentinel-2. This one has a resolution of 10 meters, so it's very precise. And you can see here a small boat and the track of the boat along the image. So it gives you an idea and, uh, of, of, of the scale. Uh, this is in the Gulf of Aden. Uh, what's, what's also important is that you can compute power spectra from these images and they, they scale with spectral slopes ranging between k to the minus 1 and k to the minus 2, which, which suggests that they are due to uh, steering by, by, the, by the eddies in, in the ocean. This, this corresponds to the idea that they are steered by eddies. So that's the first link between this plankton and the fluid dynamics is that it is steered by the horizontal movements of the fluids. So the features that you can see when you look above and you look at the colors are due to the fluid dynamics. But that's really just one part of the story. And that does not yet explain um, why uh, diversity and life is organized by fluid dynamics. And to organize that, you, you have to so, so, that's, so that's the steering, sorry. So that's showing the steering. So you have the two eddies, patches of, of, the, of the plankton which are steered and that, that's creates, creating the, the features. To have the full, oh, sorry. And that's, a, that's a, an image, a, a satellite animation showing this, this steering process and the time scale involved in the steering process. So this is over eight days. So the first aspect is how the plankton is being steered and transported, and you can look at this uh, from, from the sky. But, but one thing which is really, really important to understand what's happening in the ocean is the vertical dimension. And as I said, they are photosynthetic organisms. And if you look at the light profile in the ocean, light is being very um, rapidly absorbed. This is the first 100 meter of the water column and there's barely no light below 100 meter. So which means that photosynthesis has to occur at the surface. But photosynthesis also requires inorganic nutrients for these bugs to grow and these nutrients 
they are uh, not abundant at the surface, they are abundant below the surface. So, so you need both nitrate, nutrients and light, but they are not located in the same depth horizons. So if we move from this image to a more complete image, you need nutrients and light to produce photosynthesis, which leads to phytoplankton. And phytoplankton is being eaten and, and they sink. And this leads to organic detritus, which are brought to the, to the deep ocean. This is called a biological pump. And if you, if you think of this pump as something like the material sinking, if, then you would rapidly exhaust all of the nutrients and you would not be able to have life a second time after phytoplankton dies. So really to sustain the cycle of life, you, re, you need to bring back these nutrients to the surface. And that's where fluid dynamics comes into the picture again by, by bringing the, the nutrients up. So, so the, what is very, very important are the vertical movements of the fluids, not transporting plankton, but transporting the nutrients, which are um, necessary for the growth of plankton. So you can see this, this is an, uh, uh, an animation of the, of the ocean color. And you can see in blue, um, very big ocean deserts with very low biomass and in green ocean forests with very high levels of biomass. So you see clearly that the distribution of plankton biomass in the ocean is far from being homogeneous. There's a great deal of seasonality and um, and, and what this reflects, the fact that there are deserts and forests really reflects the fact that in some regions of the ocean, they are better connected to below than in other regions of the ocean. And in, in this ocean desert in the subtropical gyres, the wind circulation induces um, what we call a downwelling. So the vertical velocities, the mean vertical velocities go down and the nutrients are found very deep in the water column. And this explains why you have deserts. And on, on the other hand, in the forest, you have, you have a mean uh, uh, supply of nutrients, which is very seasonal, which can be very seasonal and lead, and lead to these um, plankton blooms uh, in, in, in other regions of the ocean. But so now I want to focus on a, on a smaller scale. And, and so here, this is, this is the, the, the North Atlantic. I'm taking this very small box here located in one of the ocean deserts. And I'm looking at phytoplankton in this, in this small box. And you can see here uh, a, a, a location where phytoplankton is, is more elevated than elsewhere. And you can see that it's not randomly distributed. It corresponds to a very strong temperature, surface temperature front in the ocean. And if you uh, compare the value of phytoplankton over these fronts to the value away from the fronts over like uh, an enormous amount of images. And this is what my student Clément Aeck has done. So you can see, uh, this is a time, uh, a time evolution from January to December, that over the fronts in red, you always have more phytoplankton than, than in places which are not fronts. And, and I will explain why we get this. What Clément has observed is that not only over fronts you get more phytoplankton, but you don't get any kind of phytoplankton. You get specific kind of phytoplankton. And he's used a specific uh, algorithm uh, to treat uh, ocean color images to find that over fronts, the kind of phytoplankton that are favored are these very big diatoms, which uh, are better able to take advantage of uh, a, a larger supply of nutrients than smaller phycoplankton, which were, for which we don't really see an increase over fronts. So this, this, um, this result suggests that the fact that there are more phytoplankton over fronts is due to the fact that we bring more nutrients from below over these temperature fronts. Uh, I think a, a, few, a few months back, you had Baylor Fox Camper talking about, uh, about the, the circulation of, of the ocean and the sub-mesoscale and frontal circulation. And this is really related to the kind of dynamics that Beller has taken like one hour to explain. And it's related, related to the fact that over these this fronts 
in the ocean, at the surface of the ocean. So this is a schematic of a front. You, in, you, you have a, a very strong cross-frontal agiostrophic circulation, which goes uh, up on the warm side of the front and down on the cold side of the front. And this is associated with, with a strain, uh, a jet at the surface. And this is, it's really this frontal circulation that we believe creates this, these hot spots of phytoplankton and hot spots of, of, uh, of large phytoplankton over fronts. But it's very difficult from observations in the ocean to observe the vertical cir circulation and the, the vertical velocities. So what we use mostly uh, to, to be certain that, that they bring um, nutrients to the surface is that we've been using ocean models to to derive the, the nutrient fluxes to the surface. So what are uh, um, phytoplankton models, uh, which I will be using um, in, in, this, in this presentation a lot. So phytoplankton models are in fact two models put together. The first kind of model is, uh, is ocean circulation model. So they solve the Navier-Stokes equation with some approximation for, for the ocean in a and, and, and in, a, in a, over a grid, and these are the vertical velocities from, from such an ocean circulation model. So on one hand, we, we have just this physical ocean model, and on the other hand, we built uh, models for the growth of phytoplankton, which we describe with a certain number of, of species, so here, for instance, in this model it has a large number of species with different groups of plankton and different sizes. So we have equations, different equations for all of these species, uh, which are the biological equation. And they, the, the species, so T1 to Tn, they, they follow this biological reaction and they also uh, follow the transport equation. And, and so this is really what, what we are solving, and we are solving this for plankton and for nutrients, and we can derive the nutrient budgets uh, in the upper layer of the, of the ocean, which is what is important to us. So what's very important is to look at the nutrient budget. And this is one example of the nutrient budget by Takaya Ushida, very recent study uh, in, a, in a model. This is, this is his model of the, of the Southern Ocean, with, where you can see this these fluid instabilities, these eddies, and, and you can see here the time evolution again, steps of the phytoplankton evolution with, with a strong bloom of uh, phytoplankton occurring here um, in October, November. And what sustains the bloom uh, in, in, in his analysis uh, is really the vertical flux, which is shown here, which is very strong in November. So you have a vertical flux of nutrients Across, across this layer, the, the mixed layer, which sustains the, the productivity. And, 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 and it's due to, the, to these very small, small scales here. And then it, there's another process, with, which is the vertical diffusive flux in the mixed layer. But as you can see, this flux does not cross this layer. So it's just a vertical redistribution. So mostly the, the, the flux is, is due to these uh, small scale instabilities. I want to show you an, another, another example which uses a fairly different model. So this model has, was, a, was using an ocean circulation model with a two kilometer grid. If now you move to a large eddy simulation model with a two meter grid, you can better resolve uh, the, the, the scales in the, in the surface of the ocean. And here again, I'm showing the vertical flux of nutrients uh, over, um, over a front two or three days after a storm. This is a, a study by, by Dan Witt. And, and you can see again uh, that over the front, there's a large flux of nutrient, which is going to sustain the phytoplankton bloom. And you don't see that flux where you're not over the front. So it really illustrates again, the strong vertical circulation at the front. But what uh, Dan has shown in, in addition to this, is that there was also the vertical mixing flux of nutrients, which was enhanced uh, two, three days after the storm over the fronts compared to regions which are more away from the front. So, so this is really highlighting how the different scales of the dynamics 
are important and are important to be understood to really be able to quantify how much nutrients is being brought and because this the quantity of these nutrients is going to to really uh, completely determine the quantity of life that's going to happen uh, in in the surface of the ocean so so this is what uh, just a summary of what i've just said these active processes of bringing nutrients from the deep to the surface which lead to the growth of plankton so this is a, a view of depths across across a density front and that's the secondary circulation which enables this growth i've been showing you how on the horizontal the eddies were steering stuff and, and I want to show you a, uh, another illustration of, of how this happens. That's, that's, that's a, a study by Francesco De Video, which I really like, uh, because it's a nice illustration of this steering process for, for phytoplankton. I want you to look at this image here. Each, it's, um, it's, it's over the Malvinas current, and each color uh, shows a specific phytoplankton group seen, sp seen from space. And, and one question that, that we had when we looked at this is that first you can see that the groups are not randomly organized. And we were wondering if we could understand this distribution of the different groups of plankton just by knowing the, the horizontal velocities at the surface of the ocean. And in fact, the answer is yes. Um, we took the, the horizontal velocities and the evolution of the ver uh, horizontal velocities over a few months period, and we spreaded uh, some uh, synthetic flows with different colors in this flow. And you can see that just by transporting the flows, you get features that are very similar to the one we have observed when looking at the phytoplankton groups. So that really shows that the distribution is very much linked to the transport of the groups by the surface currents. Finally, um, I've been talking about active and passive processes and the third kind of processes uh, um, are what I will call reactive processes. It's, it's the fact that once we have the fluid, the fluid dynamics, which has done something, then the ecosystem, the entire ecosystem is going to react to this. And I want to illustrate this with a, another study, which also uh, uh, I find um, interesting and where we, we used, and this is a, a study by Silvia De Monte, we used GPS tracking of frigate birds in the Mozambique Channel. So the birds were, were equipped with instruments and we could follow their flight uh, in three dimension. And by following their flight, we could uh, derive their behavior. For instance, we could uh, try to link the fast descent, we were assuming that when they were doing fast descent, meaning that was meaning that they were going to feed in the ocean. And so we, we related these events of fast descent to where they were or they were not fronts in the ocean. And you can, you can see, I mean, the, the, you can see that the, the birds, they tend to uh, descend faster over fronts than over regions that were not fronts. And, and this is uh, suggesting that uh, there is more food for them over these fronts and, and that they forage more over the fronts. So that's, that's an illustration of these um, reactive uh, um, processes. So, so just now that I've uh, introduced all of these concepts, really the question that, that we have is, is how exactly uh, passive, active, re reactive processes uh, linked to, 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 to the fluid dynamics uh, contribute to the abundance, the diversity, and the community uh, structure of phytoplankton, which, which really is the, is the description of, of most of, of the life uh, in the ocean. And, and, um, and it's, it's difficult to observe all of these uh, processes together uh, in, in, in the ocean because it's, it's really, there are fast uh, processes occurring in the four dimension um, um, and um, satellites only provide a, a view fr from the surface. We, we, it's difficult to get a profile. So what we use to better understand all of this 
our, our numerical model experiments. And I'm going to illustrate now uh, with one model, the kind of things that we can do and understand. So here I'm, I'm using a, a, a numerical model with a, a grid resolution of two kilometer, which depicts a, um, a block of the ocean, which looks which similar to the, to the Gulf Stream system. And, and so this circulation, there, so there's season, season, seasons and, and varying gradients. And, it's, um, and for the phytoplankton, we use a model developed by, uh, by the group of Mick Follows at MIT, uh, and um, which has multiple uh, phytoplankton types. So that allows to study not only the abundance, but also the diversity of plankton. That's uh, first movie. Let me try to... So this, well, mm -hmm. let me see if the, yes. So that's, that's, the, that's the total phytoplankton in, in this model. You can see there is a, a, what I call an ocean desert in the south, a forest in the north. And you can see the, the, the frontal dynamics, how it's modulating the distribution of the, of the plankton at the surface. So, so let me show you this again. Well, no, it won't show again. So let's come to this one. So uh, in the same model, we've located all the different fronts, uh, which here I are identified in, in green. And we located the different eddies in order to make statistics over the fronts, the moving fronts and, and the moving eddies of, of the plankton distribution. And as I said, we had multiple, uh, multiple phytoplankton types. These are just a subsample of these different types. You see that some are preferentially in, in the north, some uh, occupy the, the south of the domain, some are in different parts. And the question is, how do they overlap? You know, what constitutes the, why do we see one and not the other, et cetera? These are the kind of questions we try, we try to address. So looking, looking at, at the, the phytoplankton distribution over all of these fronts, this is in this model going from January to December. Um, in black, we, we have the, the, the time evolution of in, in the ocean deserts. This, this is focused over the ocean deserts for a specific group of plankton, which cor corresponds to the diatoms we've talked, um, I've talked about earlier. And so, so you see that, um, that we have more, and this is what we had expected, we had more diatoms over the fronts in greens than, than in the background or than in eddies in red. So, so that's really, uh, as I said before, an indication of active processes. This is a strong indication that nutrients are br bring brought to the surface uh, along these fronts. But another, another um, important result is that not only we have more phytoplankton over the fronts, but also we have a larger diversity of plankton, more different types of plankton over the fronts than in the background. And this is true all year long. So this is the Shannon index, which, which is a measure of, of how many different types of plankton you find at the same place at the same time. And so the question that we had is whether this could be explained by, by steering and best passive processes of, of mixing of the different types. So to, to, to address this question, we used a, a phytoplankton model with, with thermal niches. So what are thermal niches? If you look at an instantaneous snapshot, each of the color here is one specific group of plankton and where it dominates. And you can see that each specific group of plankton dominate in different niches, which are well, well separated. So we use this model where, where each place in the domain is dominated one, by one type and asked whether um, horizontal dispersal due to the, to the movement of the fluid could explain the variability uh, in the distribution of diversity. So to do this, we conducted a series of model experiments with uh, less and less dispersal. So to decrease the level of dispersal, we consider the full experiment with the total uh, movement of the fluid, and then we restricted 
the, the movement of the fluids seen by the plankton. First, we average things um, um, over, over uh, coarse grids. So we, we removed all of the eddy scales. Then we removed uh, the horizontal movements and kept only the vertical movements. And then we had another experiment with no transport at all. And we looked at how uh, moving from experiment number one with the maximum level of dispersal to experiment num number four with a minimum level of, of dispersal, we would affect the diversity of plankton. And we find a, an interesting result, which is that with uh, increasing level of dispersal, we would increase local diversity, but decrease global diversity. So what does that mean? I'm, I'm going to show you a schematic to illustrate this. So you can see this situation as being the low dispersion case. So in the low dispersion case, each phytoplankton uh, identified here by one color has one specific niche. So we have very a, a large number of niches and this, the niches, they don't come on top of each other. They are well separated. When you add dispersion, what, what happens is that you start mi mixing the niches. So the niches get, get larger, but at, at the same time, you see some of the niches, they disappear because the, the, the different types, they cannot outcompete. So there's, there's like this competition between uh, mixing of species and can I, uh, as a plankton, survive in this mixing environment? And so what, what, this, what this suggests, what this experiment suggests is that the passive processes, this, this dispersion, they increase the, lo the, the ability for local coexistence, but at the expense of, of global diversity. So next, we, we, we dig a little bit deeper into, into understanding the structure of the ecosystem. And this is a, a study by, by my student, Ines Mongolt, where she used a slightly more sophisticated plankton model, which is a model which was de um, defined by Stephanie Dutkevich. In, in this model, each phytoplankton have different growth rate, and the growth rate, they depend on the size of the plankton. So, so typically for, for the diatoms, the small, the small diatoms have a larger uh, growth rate than, than the large diatoms. And, and this is the, the distribution of phytoplankton growth rate in, in, in this model. Um, so in, in light blue, it's uh, uh, in the background and in dark blue, it's over front. So you see there's, um, there's the different plankton have different growth rates. So here we have phycoplankton, small to large, coccolithophores, small to large, diatoms, small to large, dinoflagellate, small to large. We see, um, and, and we see a sm small differences between fronts and non-fronts. And in the next slide, I'm, I'm going to focus on the differences. If you focus on the difference, what you see is that over fronts, uh, what you get is more diatoms, which is already what, what we had seen, but it's the, that the largest diatoms benefit the most for this increased input of nutrients. We see that the large dinoflagellates also benefit from it, but we see that the smaller, smaller plankton on the opposites tend to have a reduced concentration over the fronts. And this is, this is really has to, it's easy to understand as a, as a negative feedback. We have more of these, of these big guys at the surface. So they absorb a lot of the light and these, they start to, to feed, to feel the lack of light more than the others. But what's interesting is that if you relate this image of how phytoplankton growth is favored for the large diatoms to the actual amount of extra diatoms you get at the front, which is shown here. So if you look at the abundance of these diatoms, you see that the largest diatoms, they have the largest growth rate, but they are not the ones that are the most abundant at the front. And this is really an illustration of the reactive processes, because what, what happens is that these strong diatoms are being grazed, are being eaten um, more than the smallest diatoms. So the final distribution at the front does not only depend on how much nutrients you bring from below, but it also uh, depends on, on what we call the, 
the, the top-down process. It's not only bottom-up, it's also top-down. So it's also the rest of the ecosystem which is responding at the front and causing these deviations in, in, in the abundance of, of plankton. So now I want to come to the question of Earth system models. So Earth system models are the models that we use to make climate projection. And one of the issue of Earth system models is that these active, passive, reactive, these transport processes occurring on scales from one to 100 kilometer are parametrized as our subgrid processes in such models because that's this is an image of phytoplankton distribution in the ocean, and I've overlaid the size of the grid of this ocean model. So clearly you see that, uh, that all of this small scale complexity is, is uh, you cannot see it in earth system models. And Baylor was talking about this and was, and, 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 and his talk was, was really devoted to the parametrization in earth system models. He was talk, he discussed that. Um, just to illustrate again what this means, this is the SS sea surface temperature of the Gulf Stream in one model simulation with a grid of 160th of a degree. This is a work by the Meom group in Grenoble. Uh, and, and you see the, the small scales I was talking about. And if you put this on the, on the grid of an Earth system models, that's, that, that's what you would see. So one, one of the major threats of the ocean in response to climate change is the reduction in phytoplankton production. And this is what all, all climate projections uh, project for the future. This is one of these, this is, uh, um, this is one of these projections for, for an average over a large range of earth system models. So this is over, you, you see from uh, 90 to, to today, uh, the, the situation of the how much nitrate we, we have in the surface layer to, pro, to sustain phytoplankton is more or less constant. And we start to see a decline. Um, and this decline in colors is, is projected to really increase in the future. The reason why we have this decline is that is because the ocean is getting warmer. And because the ocean is getting warmer, it's, it's easy to understand that the exchanges between the subsurface of the ocean where you have nutrients and the surface where you need nutrients are going to be more difficult because there is more stratification. So, so, so that's, that's a big, big threat. And, and what we're trying to do uh, in, in uh, the climate models are trying to do is trying to uh, um, estimate the magnitude that we might expect of, of this loss. You can see here with the different colors that the, the first effect that they're going to determine the magnitude is how much carbon dioxide we put, we put in, we're going to put into the atmosphere. So we have different, so this corresponds to different emission scenario. And then within one color, you have a large range of, of change, a large range of amplitude. And this corresponds to the uncertainties we have in our models. And, and I want to show you the sensitivity uh, that we might expect, which is due to the lack of resolution. Um, we cannot afford to run, to run our climate models uh, at the resolution that would be needed uh, to have these small scales, because that, that, would, uh, that would necessitate a, a computing time, which is completely out of reach, and that's going to remain out of reach for, for a, a long, long time. But we can do that uh, for very small ocean domains. And that's one example that we did. We considered a very small ocean domain and we've run the same simulation at three different resolutions. So one degree, which is more or less uh, what we have in climate models and going to four kilometer um, resolution. And we looked at the evolution of the phytoplankton in these three models and how it would respond to climate change. So again, you see a large seasonal bloom and you see this forest um, being seasonal and you see the desert all year long in the south of the domain. So, so the main features are of, the, of the solution are the same for the three resolutions. But of course, when you increase the resolution, you see more fine scales emerging in the distribution of plankton. But the question is, uh, is it important when we make projections? 
And so to do that, we conducted a very long simulation. So that's what Damien did. So first he integrated for a hundred years, the simulation under a constant climate. And then over 70 years with a climate change corresponding to an increase in sea surface temperature of three degrees over 70 years. And, and he looked at how product, the production of plankton was modified during this period compared to this period for the three model simulations. And so, and so that's what I'm going to show you next. So that's the decrease in productivity projected under climate change at one degree resolution. So you see a large decrease in the north where in this, in this very, uh, where the productivity is initially more intense. And at 1 27th of a degree, you see also a decline. It's still negative, but it's strongly attenuated. It's much smaller. And so we tried to understand why it was attenuated by looking at the nutrient budget in the model. And by looking at the nutrient budget in the model, we could understand that the primary production uh, in, in this place of the ocean, so that's basically north of the Gulf Stream, was mainly sustained by what we call a nutrient stream. So it's the supply of nutrients from the south and a little bit of vertical mixing, which was bringing it up to feed the primary productivity. So at one degree resolution, this nutrient stream was really very strongly, strongly attenuated, which caused a very strong decrease of productivity by the order of 30%. But at higher resolution, the, in fact, the, 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 the circulation was different and the change in circulation was different. And therefore the nutrient stream was much less attenuated, which resulted in, in a reduced attenuation of primary production. So that's, that's the last uh, study I, I wanted to illustrate and are, I'm going to come to, to my uh, conclusions. So, uh, Really, I wanted to, I mean, it, for me, it's, 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 it's been a pleasure to be with you today because, because I wanted to show you how important uh, what you're doing, what everyone doing in fluid dynamics is for us interested in, the, in life in the ocean. We cannot understand life in the ocean if we don't have a good previous understanding of the flow in the ocean, of the instabilities of the flow in the ocean, of how we can model them, incorporate them in numerical models, in how we can observe them in situ. And so uh, really the no flow, no life, uh, it, it, it really means that to understand life in the ocean, to sustain life in this aphotic layer of the ocean, we understand, we need to understand uh, how the flow uh, brings the bugs around and also how the flow, the vertical flows uh, bring nutrients to the surface. And this occurs over a very wide range of scales. I've focused my presentation on the, on the scales of fronts because I think they're important, but there are other scales that are equally important. And, uh, and so these frontal flows, which are, have scales of one to hundred kilometers and one to, on the vertical, it's more on, uh, in, in, the, um, in the range one, zero to hundred meter with time scales between one day and one month. They are very important for phytoplankton growth, for, for phytoplankton diversity and for phytoplankton community structure. And therefore they're important for, for the entire food web they're important for biogeochemistry, for biogeochemical cycle, for the cycling of carbon in the ocean, in the earth system, for the cycling of oxygen in the earth system. And, and with, we, we still have progress to, to make uh, um, in many different aspects, of course, to understand the, the system completely. Uh, one aspect that I've highlighted, highlighted is, the, is the parametrization in Earth system models of these frontal flows, um, uh, which are not yet uh, completely satisfactory and they, they lead to, to a large uh, uncertainties in the magnitude of the, for instance, the magnitude of the projected uh, marine productivity uh, decline with climate change, which, which is a, a, a very uh, crucial uh, for us and for, for, the, for the living of, of uh, so, uh, such large populations uh, depending on, on marine resources. 
Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Marina. That was a, a fascinating talk. Um, while we, we get give people time to ask a few questions, um, I wondered if I could start by going back to your first image, that 30 year old, um, what was it, Ge Geographica picture of the sea surface and plankton, different colors. The first one, the, the one yeah. from the National Geographic? National Geographic, that's it. So there was a, there was a, a beautiful vortex as far as I can see, which was completely blue. And um, it, it made me wonder. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. Look at look at that. That's yes. that's astonishing, right? So, so I wanted to know whether there was any feedback of uh, the plankton on ocean flows. So, for example, presumably. Um, oh yes, the, there is a feedback. Is it the opacity? You know, basically. Yes, it's the opacity. It's a right. weak feedback. It's a weak feedback. Right. Um, it, it, but but there is a feedback. Um, because uh, be because the, the penetration of, of light and the heating uh, depends on how much uh, plankton there is. So there is yeah. a weak feedback. So, you know, the, you the, the main, the main the, um, it's very weak. The only place where it's not weak, I think it's, you, you know, El Nino, during El Nino events, uh, yeah. you have the, the productivity of plankton changes a lot. And El Nino is very sensitive to the heat content and the transport of yeah. heat in the ocean. And, and so the largest impact that I've seen illustrated was, uh, was during El Nino events. Ah, I see. Okay, well, look, we've got some questions now. So I think first was John. John, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Thanks Marina, for a wonderful talk. Um, Hi, John. Nice to see you. Hi, <laughs> you too. Uh, so I wanted to ask about this, this really interesting result um, that diatoms were more uh, elevated at fronts than picoplankton. So yes. um, now fr fronts, are, fronts are also places where there's a strong, can be a strong horizontal convergence linked with the vertical circulation. Yes. And, and buoyant, buoyant material, buoyant particles, microplastics, sargassum um, also accumulate at fronts. So um, now diatoms are, are buoyant. Uh, Generally, I think right. So they, they control their buoyancy. Do you you, you sort of talked about the the nutrient injection that's mechanism? Right, but how, how important yeah, is buoyancy? Yeah, yeah, you you are completely right. Uh, 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 in in um, how can I answer? I don't know um, how, how much the buoyancy. How, what what part of the signal is is due to the to the buoyancy and to the convergence? Uh, what I can say is that in our model they, they are not buoyant, so 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 that that's not an effect that we have incorporated in the model. And nevertheless, we see much more diatoms in the model, and that's really because they respond faster to nutrients. Mm -hmm. uh, in the real ocean, there might be some effect due to buoyancy, but I, I could not tell you uh, the, the 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 respective importance of of, of each of them. Um. I just wondered, uh, maybe it's related to John's question actually, but I just wondered if like the shape of the plankton was important and like the settling rate, because you're talking about settling over like a hundred meters, uh, whether maybe, because, like in one of the pictures you showed there was a really obvious spatial distribution, different uh, planktons were in different areas of the, um, of the field. Yes. So how does it work at such a small level? Could, can that explain any of the, the distributions? So at, at the very small level of, uh, I've never seen any, any study that have looked at the effect of, of shape on the distribution um, caused by the fluid dynamics, except at really at the scale of, of, of the animals themselves. So the fluid occurring at the scales of the animals. So here, but here I was discussing scales which are like uh, 10 orders of magnitudes are larger than, than, than the, the animals themselves. Um, so the, sh the shape of the animals are important for, um, for the, the reaction, um, like when you have different shape, you, you, you tend to avoid some of the predators by having a spikes or st stuff like that. So it's, it's ecologically, it's important for that. Uh, it's not only the shape, but it's also the size. You have to realize that they, 
uh, among the between the small plankton and the large plankton, there are three to four orders of magnitude. Okay. So, so that's also a very, uh, very important. Um, and so, when you when you think of, of uh, uh, scales, uh, centimeter scale uh, 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 movements, then that could be important, but not over the scales that I've discussed today. Hello, Marina. Bonsoir. Hello, Mar. Nice to see you. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you. I was um, curious about this idea of the passive accumulation decreasing diversity uh, over time, I guess, by overlapping niches or outcompeting others. But what do you think to which extent that affects? I guess it depends as well on which cells we're talking about or what is their activity because for instance like now that we are looking at the at the gulf stream we have seen um very often accumulations of for, for instance trichodesmium over the, the the edge of the gulf stream and of course they come from more tropical and subtropical waters and you find them up there but they are barely dead so i mean this is a passive accumulation caused by sub and mesoscale fluxes but they are not active. So we, to which extent do you think that we could uh, impact the distribution of diversity? Uh, I, I would say that in, in, in this view, what, what can happen is that, for instance, you have two different similar types uh, and some prefer a, a certain range of temperature and the other prefer another range of temperature. Mm -hmm. And when the temperature are not mixed, they can coexist. In, in their separate niche. But then when you start mixing the two together, uh, one may adapt and the other may not. And so instead mm -hmm. of having two, you, you'll have only one. Yeah, that's very interesting because then maybe in just a little tiny scale, things will change a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much for an excellent talk and lots of color. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, so I'm going back to this question about yeah the different the different niches right so the these fluid regions with characterized by different species I mean what what's the picture of the kind of memory there I mean so if you take a, a particular water mass I mean, does does the does that get remembered over a season or several seasons or I mean is it or is it the case that you know in the spring bloom there are many species in a water mass, and then as the bloom evolves, some dominate. Is what I mean. What's there's 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 there are two time scales. There there's the the time scale of who's going to dominate, which can be uh, seasonal, um, and and the, there's the time scale of, of mixing, and so and, and and there's the time scale of of and there's another time scale which is the time scale of exclusion. Like when you when you put two different types uh, and you mix them, how long does it take for for one to take advantage over the other? And so really the, the response and that I don't have a clear answer for that because there are many different situations. But but, but the conceptually the the, the response depends on, on these different processes acting on different timescales. Like who's going to dominate? Who's going to to emerge and, and, and in, in, over what time scales are they going to be mixed or transported from one place to another? So, so I mean, it's, so all those situations where you have a kind of dormant state before the spring bloom, where there are several species, and then the species that dominates is then determined by the conditions that are applying during the bloom, do you think, or is it? Well, in fact, you have you are, dormant state means you have less biomass, but doesn't mean you don't have biomass. So, so yeah, sure. Yeah. So you can have a large diversity even if you have a dormant state, uh, but they are going to be in in a, in a, in, a, in a small quantity. Uh, so, so, so they are the, the the diversity and the quantity are two different things. Uh, and and I, in fact, even during the blooms, since the blooms are usually dominated by one type, 
in, in fact, in general, during the, the bloom, you have you tend to have less diversity because you you have one type that starts to dominate for for a very short period of time over the others. So the so the pictures you were sh showing would be kind of post bloom, then would they? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, you could say that you have you have an exception during the bloom. Okay, yeah. Please comment on risks and benefits of bioengineering by addition of nutrients. Please comment. Okay, so yes, yes. In fact, uh, just maybe to answer that question, I've discussed mostly the fact that um, phytoplankton was growing through nutrients which were provided from below, but there are other sources of nutrients that can be natural sources uh, um, from from the wind, for instance, uh, um, uh, bringing, bringing nutrients from the surface. Uh, geoengineering, uh, I mean, everything uh, uh, I know about it is that uh, it doesn't work. It would, uh, it would require enormous amount of nutrients to, to bring to the ocean and it would only work once. And you can see that one, uh, and, 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 and it's not, um, if, you, if you provide nutrients to the surface, then you're going to create a bloom and the bloom is going to sink after one season. So you still need to, to find a way to, to bring it back again to the surface. So you, so you can't, it, it would have to be a continuous supply of enormous, enormous, enormous amounts of nutrients. So where, where do we take them? I, I don't, that, that's, that would be my take on that question. Thanks for a great talk. Question one, do you think the swimming organisms can contribute to ocean mixing? So uh, yes, there, there have been some, uh, some studies about that aspect as well. Um, on the fact that they could um, that they could contribute a little bit to mixing at very small scale. Right. Question two: Could the vertical motion of the organism be as important as the vertical fluid transportation in the ocean? So the 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 organisms that 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 travel uh, on the vertical, there are a lot of organisms that travel along the the, the vertical, and they are mostly. Um, not phytoplankton, but zooplankton. So zooplankton are the, the plankton who feeds on phytoplankton. So they are more sophisticated organisms. They are animals and they tend to avoid light because they, they want to avoid uh, predators during the day. So we have this, this huge uh, nuctomeral uh, uh, displacement of, of zooplankton going up and down. Yeah. Uh, and this is this is a stronger displacement than the one due to to a fluid dynamics. Oh, but that concerns zooplankton, not phytoplankton. Okay, interesting. Okay, fine. Next one due to Ryan Du. What might a changing sea ice melt rate affect ocean life? Wait. Um, how might how might a changing sea ice melt rate affect ocean life? For example, how change of salinity and temperature due to melt change? Uh, yes, so there, there are different ways. The, the, first, uh, the first is that uh, um, when, you, when you have uh, a sea ice, uh, the, the light penetration is very low. So, you, so you, you, don't, you, you have a very strong light limitation. When you melt the ice, um, the surface of the ocean sees more light. So you can grow more plankton. That's the first effect. And then there are second effects, which are the effects on, on temperature and salinity, which, which can affect the stratification of the ocean and the exchange of nutrients between the surface and subsurface. So, so there are multiple, multiple effects due to, uh, due to ice. Okay. You showed that climate change will decrease phytoplankton population due to ocean warming. How dramatic is this effect? For example, what percentage decrease might be expected for an increase in one or two degrees C? Yes, yeah, so so uh, this is um, this is something that we um, cannot observe right now with certainty because there's a, a, a large um, 
natural variability in plankton, but we start to detect uh, trends uh, from satellite images, uh, decreasing trends. So that over the last 30 years, we have 30 years now of, uh, of uh, maybe 20 years of satellite images of, of phytoplankton. We also have continuous time series of phytoplankton observations in the ocean. And these continuous time series also suggest that they, we have already experienced a decrease in, in the abundance of, of plankton. And then we have these um, Earth system models, which project a further increase in, in the future along the 21st uh, century uh, on the order of minus uh, uh, 10 to 20 percent. And as I said, the, 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 the rate of change depends uh, very much on the emission scenario, which going, which and therefore on the on the on the increase in, in global temperature and sea surface temperature. So so it's between zero minus zero and minus twenty percent, I would say. Once again, any comments about the variation and evolution of phytoplankton by genomic analyses? Uh, are there commercial efforts to engineer phytoplankton by directed evolution? So, so the the we have um, there has been um, in two thousand fifteen, I think, the Tara expedition has gone around the world, and and, and this has led to a special issue in science, and they've measured uh, through a genetic analysis uh, the the huge uh, uh, variety of plankton in the ocean. So that's definitely a, you know a, an emerging. Uh, um, research avenue, which is very important, which is uh, using these techniques to, to explore the, the huge uh, and unknown uh, diversity of plankton in the ocean. There, there are still are a, a very, very large part of the, of the plankton and of the small plankton, which are unknown. Thank, this is from Karen Bondock. Thanks for the great talk. Since viruses are the most abundant entities in the ocean, is their inter interaction with phytoplankton included as a parameter in the reactive process of the model? Yes, that's a very good question. There is a very nice study by uh, Yoav Lehan who has looked at the impact of viruses within, uh, within eddies, within ocean eddies, and his evidence that uh, the decrease in phytoplankton within a, 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 a well-formed uh, um, core uh, was decreasing over time due, due to the fact that they were imprisoned there uh, and they were slowly killing the, the phytoplankton. And yes, there is a parametrization in, in the models. Um, it's, it's a very crude parametrization, but we, we, we use a, a term which we call the mortality rate of plankton and which implicitly accounts for the viral attacks on, on the plankton. <laughs> 